Proverbs chapter number 24. I'm going to look at verse number 10 this, this morning. Proverbs 24, 10. The Bible says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Again, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now I want you to notice the relationship between the first and the last part of the verse. It says, if thou faint, then the latter part of the verse it says, thy strength is small. You know what it's talking about? It's talking about you. It is written in the third person. It's not talking about himself. He's not talking about somebody that's there with him. No, he's saying, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. He says it as a matter-of-fact statement. That's true. Right? If you faint, it's because you didn't have enough strength. Okay, we'll get into all that here in a second. But he says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. doesn't say that thy strength is weak. It refers to the size of the strength. In other words, your endurance. You can be real big and strong, but not have any endurance. Right? There are people that will boast great feats of strength, but they train for a lift that lasts 10 seconds. Right? There are also people that pick up heavy things and they go a very long ways with them. That's two different types of strength. Are they both strong? Yes. Strong in different ways. But what the proverb is trying to get across to us, he says, it doesn't matter what you can do when you're moving at your own pace, when you're the one that gets to decide the lifting schedule, when you're the one that gets to decide when you start and when you don't start. He says that's called a casual day. That's an easy day. He says, if thou faint in the day of adversity. You know what adversity is? Literally, it's hardness or hardship. Adversity doesn't come with the context of being easy. In fact, adversity takes all of your strength in order to make it through. If you are not strong, you will not last through adversity. If you do not have strength, you will not endure to see the end right, of what it was that you were enduring for. You don't receive the reward. That's the standard that this proverb is trying to get across. He says it doesn't matter how much you can lift on an easy day. What matters is how long you can stand on a hard day. It doesn't matter if you can lift a house above your head with one hand. He says, if the enemy shows up and you can't pick up a simple rock, your strength is no use to you. He says, your strength is small. I don't care what you can do when everybody's applauding you and people chanting your name and they want to see you succeed. He says, let's put you in front of the enemy that wants to see you fail. How's your strength on that day? Okay, I know a bunch of guys, they all look like me and Christian now but used to we were skinny and in shape okay I never quite got to skinny but I got close a few times okay but we were in shape we thought until every year what would happen well the winter season would end and then this thing called conditioning would start again we lifted all year round but when we started running again that's when they told us that we weren't in shape anymore doesn't matter how much you ran the last year Unless you run today, you're not going to be in shape tomorrow. Right? It's amazing how you just take one or two weeks off for the dead period. And you come back and it feels like you haven't run in like six months. You know what that is? That's your body quickly adapting to things changing. Spiritually, the same is true. Your flesh is very quick to adapt when it wants to. And very slow to adapt when you want it to. Right? That's why it's our cross to bear. Because it is a labor to keep the flesh in check, Amen. to strive against it, to whip it into shape. 
right? But it's very easy and it's very simple to let the f flesh change into what it wants to and all of a sudden what you thought was strength, now it's gone. Yeah, well. It says about faint in the day of adversity. doesn't say that you're unable to do great acts of strength. doesn't matter. He says, on the day of adversity, nobody cares, okay, that you looked like a video game character and you picked up a car and threw it at a bad guy. Nobody cares if you don't make it through the fight. What good is all the effort, all the planning, and all the training that you've done if you can't even make it through the day? He says, if you faint, I don't care how big your muscles are. You're not strong. He says, if you faint in the day of adversity, that's what you train for. That's what you're anticipating. Right? If life was going to be easy from here on out, we wouldn't have to grow as Christians spiritually. We could remain babes in Christ. But no, we're encouraged, having done all to stand, stand therefore. You know what that means? Endure. Last. Okay, in the day of adversity, don't faint. Be one of those that's still standing tall and proud at the end of the day. There may come a day where from sun up to sun down, spiritually, you feel like you're in the midst of a battle. And I hate to break it to you, the devil don't pay, play fair. He doesn't stop when the sun goes down. Right? It may be day in, day out from the time that you open your eyes until you finally drift off to sleep at night. Whatever is weighing on you, spiritually, mentally, maybe even physically. But all the suffering, all the pain, everything that you've endured, it doesn't count for anything if you faint. But they don't give out trophies to people that don't finish marathons. They'll give you nine hour, you know, nine hundred hours to do it. They've still got people crossing, you know, they do the Boston Marathon. Every, there are people crossing like up till midnight. You can tell I don't run that race. I'm giving y'all three hours. The quickest dude's going to do it in like an hour and change. Okay, almost two hours. And if you guys finish in three, we'll give you something. Other than that, go home. All right, we're not keeping the roads closed that long. Go away. All right, come back when you're in shape. Well, I didn't give up. Right, we look, from the world's view, we look at that as a waste of effort. No, it's not. In truth, they set forth a goal, and regardless of the adversity they faced along the way, they were going to finish. That doesn't matter whether they finished first or they finished last, they finished. Right, that's the problem with most Christians. We think we need to do it best or quickest. That's not God's standard. Finish. What did the Apostle Paul take pride in, take joy in, as he wrote his epistles? I fought a good fight. I finished my course. He says those are the two standards that God cares about. How did I fight? I, fight with, I fought with everything I had. You know what happens if you fight a good fight? As a boxer, you make it all the rounds. Or you put the enemy down before the rounds are over. But either way, you didn't faint. You were the one that endured it. Notice, he didn't even say that he won the fight. He just said he fought a good fight. Because he wasn't relying on himself to win it. He said, the Lord told me to stand. Told me to make up the head, stand in the gap. Told me to go and to tell people. He says, everything I did, I didn't quit. I fought. I never fainted. Then he says he finished his course. That means what God had laid out for him, he saw it through to the end. Twice he tells us it's not about how strong you are, it's about how long you can last. Okay, some people say it this way it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Don't judge things based off of what they look like because there's a lot of things that are going to faint in the day of adversity. There's a lot of things 
that on a normal day they have no trouble but in a day of hardness in a day of hardship in the day where the enemy is contesting against it it doesn't last too long I don't care how big and strong your gate is if there's not a wall attached to it the gate doesn't do you too good But if you were really fortifying, you'd make sure that there weren't any gaps in the wall. Because the gate doesn't do you too good if there's a hole in the wall big enough for somebody like me to fit in. Because that means a whole bunch of people smaller than me can fit in too. It means that they can take that hole and they can make it bigger for more people to fit through. But it's not about strength in one area, it is about endurance in all areas. Now, as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about this, that makes sense to me. I don't care how strong you are. If you don't make it through the battle, your strength doesn't do any, anybody any good. If you put on the whole armor of God and start hyperventilating because you haven't trained to stand in it, to wear it around, to live in it, then the armor's not going to do you any good and you're not doing anybody else any good. Because if you faint in the day of adversity, you know what is required? Somebody else to come and to take you out of danger. Fainting is a very selfish thing. Because it says, I don't care that I'm not going to make it through the day. I'm going to make somebody else drag me off the battlefield. People that had a little self-respect would say, I ain't got, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not going to make it. I'm only going to be in the way for other people. I'm going to be a hindrance. God can use that. God, he resists it the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. The humility of understanding that I can't stand on my own. That's true. But people that put all of their faith in what? Strength. You know what the Bible says about strength? First it says that the arm of flesh will fail you. That means anything that you're relying upon, your ability to make it happen, one day it's going to fail you. It's a rope bridge. You say, what's that mean, Brother Jordan? It'll work for a while until you put too much weight on it. Rope bridges work until the rope snaps. And it don't take the whole rope giving away for the thing to cave in. Just takes a couple of those fibers cracking, snapping, twisting, and then the next thing you know, the bridge is gone. Say, so why is that, Brother Jordan? Because it met or it exceeded its limits. Well, the arm of the flesh has a limit, the strength of the flesh has a limit. Now, am I saying not to condition your flesh not to train your flesh to be subject to the will of God no that's not what I'm saying I'm just saying if your faith is in what you can do for God you're not going to get much done you're going to be building a lot of rope bridges then on the other hand the Bible also teaches us that not only will the arm of flesh fail us okay it also says that our, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. If you want the strength of God in your life, you must embrace the fact that you are frail and weak. Notice he doesn't say you have to be strong in order to endure. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. He's not saying... That only the strong lasts through the day of adversity. He's just saying if you're trusting in your strength and adversity comes along, are you going to make it? That's what he's saying. He's saying if you think you're big and bad, what about if the enemy shows up tomorrow? You're going to be able to stand all day? Because he says, because if you don't make it till the end of the battle, you're weak. He's challenging people whose standard is in the wrong place. You know why the Apostle Paul finished? Because he trusted the Lord to take every step with him. You know why the Apostle Paul said that he fought a good fight? 
Because he only fought the things that the Lord said he was strong enough to fight. He left the rest to the Lord. I don't see the Apostle Paul out on the deck of the ship during the middle of that storm, Eurachlodon, rebuking the winds and the waves, trying to make the storm stop. No, I find him on the inside of the ship. He's talking with the Lord. What did the Lord tell him? He said, you're going to lose the ship. You're going to lose all the goods on board. And he said, but nobody's going to die as long as everybody stays on the ship. And the centurion believed him. In fact, the centurion said, if anybody tries to get off the ship, I'm going to kill them. That's how much he believed what Paul said. You know what that centurion saw? He said, he may look a little weak and a little frail. He may be getting up there in age. Okay, if that thorn in the flesh was his eyesight, right? he said, you know, his eyes have gotten a little milky. Maybe he's had cataracts. He can't see like he used to, but I'll tell you something. If that guy said God said it, I believe it. He said, there's not much to look at. In fact, if we were to believe everything written about Saul of Tarsus before he was converted to Paul, he was a studious bookworm. He looked like a nerd, man. That's what he was. He was a scholar. He was a man of letters. He was no warrior. Right? He wasn't ready to be thrown and cast into prisons time and time again. What was it? He was one of the chosen elites. He was used to a life of luxury. And yet you find him turn his back on all of it to what? To more often than not have people pursuing him trying to kill him. Devising schemes against him. He's living out on the road. He's living in borrowed beds and he's mending tents with his bare hand and fishing nets just to make ends meet because he doesn't want to be a hindrance or a burden to the people that he's trying to win for the Lord. He says, I didn't want to give anybody cause to say, that guy's a freeloader. You know what he did? He faced adversity every day. We think we face adversity. He was living on the faith and the grace and the goodness of God. Amen. He truly knew what it meant having food and raiment to be content therewith. Because a lot of times he didn't have a bed. And even the nights that he had a roof over his head, most of the time it was in the inner part of a jail that was filled with the refuse from all the other prisoners. He was thrown into the places of the jail that infection would kill you before you ever had a trial date. That's where they put the worst of the worst because they didn't even want to waste time on a trial. And you know when they throw him in there? After he had been beaten. Had open wounds and sores all over him. You tell me it's not a miracle that he didn't drop dead of a disease ten times over by the time he finally was delivered to Rome to stand before Caesar? You know what that was? He was relying on the Lord's strength, not his own. He knew his strength wasn't going to get him from where he was to where he needed to be. But at some point, God clued him in. He says, Paul, don't worry about this. He says, you've got to make it all the way back to Rome. He says, you've got to stand before Caesar and testify me. The Apostle Paul said, okay, I know where I'm going to end up, but I still don't know how I'm going to get there. You know what he woke up every day prepared to do? To strive against the enemy. He was prepared for adversity. You'd look at him and say, that guy's been left for dead more times than I can count on one hand. That's true. You'd say, he's had missionaries that have turned their back on him because they had differences in opinions on what it was that God said on some things. That's true. He's had people that he truly trusted in it, like Alexander the coppersmith. Do him dirty. Stab him in the back. He's had people that he trained up and taught the ways of God, loved the applause of men more than the favor of God the Father. He's had people that he confided in and trusted in turn their back on him because they love this present day more than they love the thought of laying up things for eternity. The Apostle Paul had every type of adversity 
that you could face. And you know what he learned? You realize that he was going through all that and God still gave him a thorn in the flesh. That thorn in the flesh. You know what it was to do? To keep him from trusting too much in the strength of the flesh. I believe that after the third time he prayed and he said, Lord, will you remove this thorn of the flesh? And he said, no. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for thee. He said, okay. I get it now. But I believe that for the rest of his life, he was trying to understand how sufficient God's grace was and how truly powerful the strength of God was. God didn't say, here's both of them. He said, no, this thorn is to get you closer to me. It's so that you can understand my grace more completely. He says, it's so that my strength can show up more abundantly. And the Apostle Paul embraced the thorn because he knew that to get closer to God in his flesh, he would have to get further from what he used to be. Further of what Saul was and closer to what Paul needed to be. You know what Saul did? Saul trusted in the flesh. He was smart. He knew the law. He knew the tenets of all the religious customs of the day. Knew many languages. Had many connections. Right? He had the connections and if he wanted you dead, he could get the warrant signed real quick. He was there the day that Stephen was stoned. Don't know that he was involved in it. He held the coats of the men that stoned him though. And then we know that on the road to Damascus, he had in his papers the rights to persecute and kill Christians. He was a man that if he wanted it done, it could be done. If you told him to do it, there wasn't any doubt that it was going to be done. That is like the mob. If you want something done, call Paul. Or call Saul. Saul, take care of it. Then one day they get introduced to this guy named Paul. He's a guy that don't trust anything in the flesh. By the end of it, he says, I don't even trust my own handwriting anymore. You read the epistles, he says, I've written such a large letter to you, talking about the size of the letters. It was long because he could only fit so many letters across the side of the scroll because he had to write them so big that he could read them. He says, I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to write it in my own hand. At a certain point, he didn't even write them anymore. Read the epitaphs or the introductions of the epistles. It'll say that the Apostle Paul by such and such servant are delivered by this person to that church. He wasn't writing them. He was saying, write this down. Then he may sign it or he may put his seal on it. But he says, take that down to those people and let them know that I love them. He wasn't even trusting in his ability to write any longer. He was just trusting that God had given him what those people needed to hear. And he wasn't going to let chains and he wasn't going to let the inconveniences of the flesh knock him out of the fight. Solomon says, if you faint, then your strength is weak. He says, it's not that you have to go out there and you have to be a super strong battle warrior for God. Now ask me how many times but David had to fight Goliath once now there were other days that he went out and he fought other giants but he didn't fight giants every day God doesn't expect you to be Superman every day even on the days that you face something that you thought you'd never be able to conquer God doesn't make you look like Superman when he does it God takes the base things and uses them to confound the wise it's not about your strength. It's about his strength. God's strength, he told the apostle Paul, made perfect in weakness. You know what that means? When you have no faith in your own abilities and all of your faith is put into what God is capable of doing, God can step in and do a whole lot. You know what David believed? David believed that that Philistine 
deserved to die because he blasphemed against God. The crime was not against David. Goliath hadn't stole from him. Goliath hadn't insulted him. Goliath hadn't killed any of his brothers. He didn't have a revenge claim against him. David showed up and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That's another way of saying, what's that heathen talking about? He says, that guy who doesn't know the truth is out there telling lies against our God. He says, and you're sitting here quivering. You know why he rebuked him? Because he said, you don't have to fight him. He's already made himself an enemy of God. Do you realize that the sheep don't have to fight when the wolf shows up? That's the shepherd's job. David said, I don't have to whoop him. I just have to go out there and face him and God will do the whooping. He says, God's proven that before. He says, I've got a sling. Right? Glorified or primitive slingshot. Spin it around, whip, let go of half of it, and the rock goes. Okay, it's a hand trebuchet if you want to get real specific. Okay. Now them things can move. And they can do a lot of damage. But you got to get real precise. And you got to get real lucky to just kill a normal guy walking down the street. Right? We've got thick bones. Some of us have harder heads than the others. Okay? I've got a real thick skull. Okay? I've gotten into a stubborn contest with mules than one. Okay? But when you start talking about a bear or a lion, which David said the Lord delivered into his hand, he said, I was out there watching the flocks of my father. He said, and the father entrusted the flock to me. He said, but I was just out there overseeing. He said, they were still the fathers. He said, and my father, Jesse, before he entrusted that flock to me, he entrusted that flock back to God. You ever wonder why his father, when he had so many other qualified sons, would send the scrawny one, right, the outcast, the one that everybody else looked at and they said, that boy can't do anything. And you ever wonder why he would send that one out there into the field to protect something else? The man of God shows up and he's looking at all the sons of Jesse and he said, surely there's a king among these ones. And every time he thought, man, that one's got some kingly, kingly qualities. You know what God said? Nope. He gets all the way down. He says, we've run out of sons, God. He says, now ask if there's any more. He said, you got another one? He was like, oh yeah, but the, the one out in the field, we, we know you didn't want him. We didn't even call him to the meeting. He said, call him. David didn't trust in his own strength because he knew from everybody else around him that there wasn't anything special in David. Jesse let him go out there in the field because he believed that God could keep David just like he's keeping them flocks. David said, the Lord delivered into my hand the bear and the lion. You know what that means? I didn't deserve to whip either one of them. He said, God told me I was to go out in them field, I'd have to learn how to protect them sheep. He didn't use the staff. They weren't strong enough. Maybe not tall enough to wield a true staff at that time. He didn't have the range and the reach to use it. Didn't use the sword. Didn't use a cane. Didn't go out with a shield. In fact, they went to go put Saul's armor on top of him. He swallowed him up. He said, I can't move in this thing. He said, I haven't proved this. I don't deserve this. He says, I'm going out there in my shepherd's clothes. I know how to move in those. I know how to walk in those. If I need to, I know how to run in those. He says, this... I can put faith in this, not because it's strong, but because it's been proven. He says, I can trust that sling because God's touched it before. I already said, it's hard to knock a guy out with one if you are a good shot and he's not wearing armor. Now imagine trying to take down the biggest dude you've ever seen with a shield so heavy that it's another guy's job just to walk around and carry it in front of the guy. 
Right? He's got a spear that's probably about as thick around as David is. Right? And he can pick that thing up and hurl it. It says it's like a weaver's beam. This guy isn't scared of anything because he knows how strong he is. He's got a sword so heavy that when David draws it to take off the head of Goliath, he can't even pick it up. He's got to drop it over the head of Goliath. Right? Like a cheese slicer. He had to leave part of it on the ground and just let it fall because he couldn't lift it. His faith wasn't in his strength. It was in what God had trained him for. He says, I'm going to make it through this day not because I'm the strongest. He says, that'd be Goliath. Not because I'm the bravest. He says, I'm not being brave. I'm just claiming what it is that God promised. That if we'd go out and fight for the honor and glory of God against those that would blaspheme Him, that He'd be with us. He's not trusting in His ability as a slingshotter. He's trusting in God's promise and that God would keep it. That's why He rebuked the armies. Who is this uncircumcised? He says, essentially, it'd be like if I came over to your house and literally started messing up the yard, getting mud on my feet and wiping it on the welcome mat at the front door, and all the while telling you how bad your wife's cooking is. That ain't going to go over well, is it? <coughs> right? You'd be rather angry with me. They weren't angry, they were scared. He said, I don't care who he is. Nobody talks about God that way. He says, I'd rather die than continue on listening to him talk about God like that. He says, and I've just got here. Y'all been here for months, days. From sun up to sundown, none of y'all have gotten angry just a little bit. He says, he's talking about God. Not talking about me. He can say whatever he wants to about me. Not going to make me angry. We've already said, David knows he's the skinny run. He knows he's the outcast in the family. The rest of them look like kings and princes. And then there's that old redheaded boy out in the field. He didn't trust in his strength. But you know what David trained to, trained to do? Regardless of what he faced, he was ready to stand. As long as it needed to take. What do you find happens after this? Well, after David chops off the head of Goliath, you know what they did? The armies of Israel ran the Philistines out of town. It says they fought all day. Goliath in the day of adversity, his strength didn't get him to the end of the day. But yet that scrawny little red-headed boy didn't run out of energy until the sun went down. Who was really stronger? I don't care how strong you are. If you don't last, you're not strong. Don't care how powerful you are. If your power runs out, you're not strong. God told the Apostle Paul, and he's proved it many times throughout his Bible, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. He says the strongest you're ever going to be is when God steps in and does something for you. Endurance. How do you endure? Through grace, through mercy, through the long-suffering of God, through the mercies of God that are renewed toward us every day. He says, your strength comes from another world, another place. It's delivered to us and ministered to us by God Himself through the person of the Holy Ghost. He says, when you stop trusting in what it is you can do, and instead you embrace what it is God called you to do, you just get ready to do what God wants you to do, God will give you an opportunity to do it. And if all you're focused on is what you can do, God will take care of the things you can't do. If like David, you say, the only thing I'm good at is putting a rock in this sling and letting it loose. They say, well, he's got too much armor on. That's not my problem. That's God's problem. I can see his forehead. That's what I'm going to aim for. And if God delivers him into my hand, great. He didn't even entertain the other option. Go read the story. He said, the Lord delivered the lion, the bear. He says, and he will do the same. 
You know what he said? There's only one outcome. I'm winning. You say, that's hubris. That's pride. Wasn't any pride in it. Keep in mind who we're talking about. It's the little lad, David. He's not a man yet. He's not a man of war yet. He doesn't have his ten thousands, the Saul's thousands. He's a, he's a lad with a slingshot. And he says, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to whoop that guy. He says, not because of what I can do. He says, God's going to put him right in my palm. Just like he did with the lion and the bear. He's saying, look at me. He says, I couldn't win a fight against a sheep, let alone a bear. He says, but God, let me slay a lion and let me slay a bear. He says, it's not about me. It's about what God did for me. He says, it's not about what I can do. It's about what God can do with the tools that he gave me. He says, I'm going to aim for his forehead because that's the only spot I can see. He says, but if God wants it to go through the shield and then through the armor, nothing's going to stop that rock. Because nothing is going to prevent God from doing what God wants to do. He says, so I'm going to go out there and face him. Because it's not about my strength. Well, look at verse number 10. He says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. He's talking about physical strength. But by implication, he's saying true strength is not in your ability to do. True strength is in your ability to withstand. In order to avoid fainting, you know what you have to do? You've got to be able to dig deep. You know when you faint? You faint well, for several reasons. But you faint because you get overwhelmed. You ever wonder why in the old TV shows the ladies would bust out the fans and go, oh, well, have mercy, and then faint when like, bad news would come? It's because their brain got overstimulated. They got overwhelmed. Why do you faint physically? Because your body was overwhelmed. You reached a physical task, and your body gave out. It couldn't handle it anymore. You lost consciousness because that's your brain's way of protecting the rest of your body. Your brain says, if we keep doing this, we're going to die. So it turns the lights out for you. Truly, that's what the mechanism of fainting is. You say, well, that's a dumb thing to do. Well, if it comes down to we might die, right, if we lay down and take a nap for a little bit or we are going to die if we keep doing this fainting's not the worst option if you do die at least you're going to die in your sleep you say it's cruel brother Jordan that's what your brain's thinking that's how your body's designed the flesh is selfish it says if we can save me regardless of whatever this guy wants to do we're going to turn the lights out we're going to look out for our best interest but that fainting happens because you become overwhelmed. That should be a very hard thing to do to a Christian. A true Christian should not be able to be overwhelmed. You say, well, Brother John, I've got this going on in my life and that going on in my life and this is coming from over here. I understand all that. But if you're trying to control it, your strength indeed is small. It's going to overwhelm you. Well, this happened this week, and that person called and gave me this news, and that gave me... That all may be true. But if you're putting that in your basket, that basket's going to cause you to faint. You know what's supposed to be in your basket? You. And you're supposed to give that basket to God. Lord, here's my basket. Take it. Use it. Lord, this is all I've got and everything belongs to you. It's real hard to get overwhelmed when you've given everything to somebody else. It's really hard to be concerned about the intricacies and details of something that you know you have no power over when instead God has entrusted you with something that he says, will you be faithful and a servant for me in this area? You do realize that's the deal that the master makes with the servant. But he didn't call his servants, he called his sons. 
A master says, whatever problems the servant had before, they're my problems now. Don't care what he did before he became my servant. Whatever it is, put it on my account. He belongs to me now. It would have been enough if he would just done that. But no, no, he says, you may see him as a servant, but that's one of my sons. He's a part of the family. You know what a son gets? The father for a servant says, whatever he had now belongs to me. Good, bad, ugly, it's all mine now. You want to talk about those things from the past? You come and talk to me. Don't come and talk to him. You know what the father says about his son? He says, everything that I own, the son owns. You're a joint heir with Christ. He says, I'll take all of your past and you can have all of my future. Amen. He said, I'll take all the weight, all the rest, take my yoke upon you. Jesus didn't say, put your yoke on him. No, 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 no. He said, I took all of the things that you thought were heavy, I threw it into my wagon. You just come over to my wagon, you yoke up with me. He said, I was carrying it all along anyway. He says, but all the things you thought were heavy, pfft, I picked them up, threw them in the back of my wagon. Got tons of wagons in there. He says, I've been pulling everybody else's wagon as long as I've been pulling. He says, yoke up with me. He says, I don't want your wagon. Your wagon, too small. He says, your wagon couldn't fit me. Instead, you come over to my yoke. I've made you a spot right next to me. And all I'm asking you to do is to pull yours. He says, I'm not asking you to pull your sin, to pull all of your problems, to pull all of the confusions or adversity in your life. He says, I just want you to pull what I ask you to do for me. What you can. He says, I'll take care of the rest. Amen. The people that last in the day of adversity, they don't get overwhelmed because they've got a focus. They've got a goal. They've got something to keep them motivated with. I don't care how big and scary the enemy is. God told me to stand here. As long as I stand here, I've done my job. Let the wind howl. Let the rain blow. Right? Let the waters capsize into the boat. God told me to be here. And I'll be here. Well, what if the boat starts sinking? God will tell me to do something different. But I do remember there was a time where the disciples were in a boat and the Bible says that it was full of water. You know what that means? It should have already been under the water, sinking. And yet he came out on deck and rebuked the winds and the sea. He said, peace, be still. Another time he came out walking on the water. He told him he'd meet him on the other side. He wasn't even going to stop. They were going to struggle. You know why? They were trusting in the wrong strength. They'd been rowing all night. You know what it says? It's wore out. They've been fighting against the waves and the wind all night long. And they'd gotten to the point that they was about out of strength. You know what they realized? Their strength wasn't enough all along. God promised to see them to the other side. He said, I'll see you on the other side. And he's walking by to what? To be on the other side to meet them when they get there. Peter called out. You know what he realized? My strength's not enough. And he said, help. That's what it boils down to. You know what God told him? Get away from your problems. Come out here to me. Leave all that behind. That's too much for you. Just come out here to me. By the way, Peter did walk on water all the way out to him. Till he took his eyes out of him. And he walked on water all the way back. Well, you say, when Peter was small in his own eyes, he was walking above the problems that just a minute ago had him defeated. When he rolled all of those things that were out of his control, he wasn't overwhelmed anymore. When he was focused on Christ and what Christ wanted him to do, he was above all the things that just a minute ago had him defeated. Then what? He took his eyes off of him and saw the wind boisterous. What happened? He feared again. He thought, well, at least over there I had the protection of the wood from the ship. What happened? He became overwhelmed. He got to the point that Jesus wasn't big enough in his eyes to take care of those things around him. When he said, Lord, save me, Jesus reached out and touched him. Then he realized again what? Jesus had it all under control all along. 
It's on the way back, you don't see him looking around at the wind and the waves anymore. What do you see him doing? I see him walking right next to Jesus. When you get overwhelmed, that's when you become exhausted. That's when you faint. But when you can keep a clear goal in mind, how did the Apostle Paul finish that race? Because he was looking at the finish line. How did he fight a good fight? Because he was focused on fighting what was in front of him, not everything else that was all around him that he had no control over. He said, Lord, you've put this enemy in front of me. This is what I'm supposed to deal with. You take the rest of it. And when his flesh wanted to quit, what did he have? He said, he said his face toward heaven like what? A flint. Nothing could shake it. He had his eyes set on Jesus. And nothing was going to deter him. He kept himself from getting overwhelmed. You say, how was he able to sing at prison at midnight? After he'd been beaten and thrown in there with Silas. How was he able to have compassion on the guard, guardsmen of the jail? How was he able to say, hey, stay your sword. We're all here. God's just doing something in here. If you want to learn about it, here's how you can be saved says he and his whole house believed how were they able to do that they had perspective they weren't looking at everything they were just looking at God they weren't worried how they were going to get out of prison they were just worried on what God wanted them to do next they weren't concerned with anything other than Lord what would you have me do and you know what he wanted in that moment they started singing praises and what happened? God shout, showed up and shouted amen on a few of them songs. Shook the whole prison and all the locks came undone. Don't become overwhelmed. Because an overwhelmed Christian isn't a lone Christian. An overwhelmed Christian is one that's soon to faint. And if you faint, you're helpless. Can't do anything for yourself. But you know what you can do? You can do what God asks you to do. And He'll take care of the rest. To have great strength, you must have great faith. And to have great faith, you must have a great understanding of what God has promised to do for you and can do for you. Because if you don't know that He promised to do it, you won't believe that He can. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.